Good morning and Happy New Year. This is author C.K. Brooke coming to you from gray, snowy Detroit, Michigan. Thank you for listening to our brand new YouTube audio segment, a series of interviews by authors, for authors, and aspiring ones. And of course, for our fans, which I like to call enough of my books, let's talk about yours. My very first guest of 2019 is Ren Handman. Ren is a novelist, fiction writer, and screenwriter. She's written three novels, Last Cut, which was published by Lorimer Limited in 2012, Command the Tides, published by Omnific in 2015, and In Restless Dreams, which was originally self-published and is now forthcoming from Parliament House Press. Check out The Switch, Ren's TV comedy about trans life in Vancouver. Wow. So that is quite a resume, and I'm honored to have you here today, Ren. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. You are so very welcome. Thanks for being here. So right off the bat, the TV comedy writer thing is really interesting, and I definitely have some questions for you about that. But first, the beginning being the best place to start. Ren, if you will, could you please walk us through your earliest experiences with creative writing and how it all began for you? Yeah, I mean, I was one of those kids who was writing stories when I was, you know, three and four years old. I wrote my first play when I was in kindergarten and got my teacher to help us perform it in front of the whole class. Uh, I wrote my first novel when I was in grade eight. I wrote another one in high school. Just sort of always been doing it, always been passionate about it, always something that I knew I wanted to put my energies into. Were there any authors or particular books you remember from back then that inspired you? Oh gosh. I read so voraciously and so far above the level that I probably should have been reading at the time. <laughs> um, Golden Compass was a huge one for me. That was the first series that I put my own money into buying when the new ones started coming out. The first hardcover book I ever owned was the third in that series. Wow! I love Philip Pullman. <laughs> oh, he's amazing. And I just discovered he has a whole series of Victorian um, mystery novels that I just got into. They're really good. Oh, really? Are they are they published under Philip Pullman, or does he have another pen name for those? Or? No, they're, they're published under the same name. I don't know how I missed them for years. They came out, I think, even before Golden Compass did. Oh, wow. I'll definitely have to check those out, too. Yeah, they're fantastic. <laughs> Ruby and the Smoke is the first one. Nice. Okay. Yeah, I, I didn't get to the, um, what is it called? The Mortal Instruments? Or, or no, not Mortal Instruments. What's it? Um, yes, Dark Dark Materials, I'm thinking of Cassandra Clare or whatever, his Dark Materials. Yeah, I was in, I think, high school when, you know, when the movie came out, and that's when I kind of picked up the books, but that's great. So you were reading them at an even younger age, and I know those are fairly advanced, so it sounds like you were just quite a quite a book lover right from the get-go. Oh, yeah. I've been a nerd from day one. <laughs> so... And that's fantastic. That's why we're all here. I think all of us that... So are you are you writing fantasy novels, by the way? Um, I write a little bit of everything, but most of my stuff does have some kind of fantastical or paranormal element. My first book did not, but everything that I've done since then has. And I do adult and young adult. Oh, great. Okay. So, um, so kind of segueing into that, because, you know, you have your two publications with... Are they two different publishers, or are they imprints in one publisher? They're two different publishers. Okay. So um, the first one, Last Cut, is the one that has no paranormal. So it's a contemporary teen, and it's for teenagers with reading difficulties. So it's a very specific imprint line where they do true-to-life stories that are really realistic and are designed for people who are having a hard time kind of struggling with their, their reading and language comprehension. Oh, wow. So is that something that you were sort of assigned to do? Or did you just happen to write this story and then you found a publisher that just fit that perfectly? Or how did that come about? It's actually a very funny story. Um, so I had written a completely different novel about a teen runaway. And I submitted it to them and they loved it. And we started chatting. And partway through the conversation, we realized that somehow when I had submitted I had missed the fact that they only do what they call true-to-life stories. Okay. Um, and I have absolutely no personal experience with sort of that world and that experience. And they kind of went, oh, well, crap, we can't publish this. <laughs> um, so we started chatting because they really liked the work and they liked, you know, what I had done. So they said, well, what if we kind of come up together with an idea of something that would still appeal to our reader base but would be more from your own life experiences. Ah, so it was sort of like a reworking of something you had done and then you reworked it to fit their criteria. I had to start completely from scratch. 
Yes. Uh huh. Okay. <laughs> no, and that happens. Like I, um, some people who are listening are not published yet, or maybe haven't even finished their first, you know, manuscript yet. And um, and folks, that does happen. Sometimes you write a full novel, and then uh, for whatever reason, you'll find yourself rewriting it from the beginning from a different angle. Um. I, I know, like, with my first book, The Duchess Quest, I had originally written it as, like, an epic fantasy saga with multiple POV, and I had to kind of, you know, chisel that way down to, like, a third the length and streamline it into, like, a romance, like a YA romance. So it does happen. You will sometimes find yourself rewriting a book um, from, you know, for a different genre or different demands. So that's really interesting. So then, so, cause I was going to ask you, that was my first question for you was that, you know, you have these, these two different publishers and then three, including three different publishers, including with your forthcoming novel. Um, and so, so why the switch between publishers? I think you kind of answered that the first one just as the true to life. And so you probably needed to find another home, uh, when you started writing the more fantastical stuff again. Um, yes. So, so tell me about tell me about Omnific. Yeah, so Omnific is a they're an American um, traditionally romance publisher, but they do what they call romance without borders. So they're trying to do romance novels that are less um, in the norm, so to mm -hmm. speak. Um, so with them, I have never particularly uh, written romance, and I heard that they were looking to kind of expand their borders and do stuff that was a little bit different. So I have this. Uh, fantasy novel. It's an adult fantasy novel, Command the Tides, and it has a strong romance through line. A lot of the stuff I write has sort of secondary love stories within them, but they're not the main fo focus of the story, so they don't often fit with the sort of traditional romance where the, the romance is the more the most important part of the book and the plot often sort of takes second fiddle to that. Mm -hmm. So I approached them about it and they really liked it and they decided to publish it, but it was the first time they had ever done a fantasy novel. So they were a fantastic team. I absolutely loved everyone I worked with, but it just wasn't what they were used to doing, and they found it really hard to break into the you know the fantasy blogosphere. They didn't have contacts with those people, so it just ended up, unfortunately, not going as far as either of us had hoped that it would. That definitely happens sometimes. You know, you can be hooked up with a fantastic company that that does everything, but maybe just the genre or the audience is just slightly, you know, it's skewed for something else. And uh, yeah, that that certainly happens. Um, I was going to ask you about Omnific for anybody listening who might have a romance manuscript that they're looking to pitch. Um, is is this in um, the type of publisher you don't need an agent to submit to, or do you have to have an agent? You don't need an agent. They do take unsolicited manuscripts, which is how I connected with them. Um, they're a phenomenal company. They don't like first-person point of view. So just a heads up if you're uh, oh. writing that. They prefer third person. That's good to know. And now when when they say they're romance without borders and that they take more unconventional romances, does that mean that it does not have to be an HEA, a happily ever after, or does it still require the, the, the standard romance novel HEA ending? It definitely does not. Well, I, I assume that it does not. Um, mine certainly follows a, an unconventional, uh, has a very unconventional twist at the end. So I think that they're very open to that. They're also open to LGBT content. Um, they're open to historicals and stuff with genre elements in it. That's great to know. So folks, that's omnific. Um, so moving down to the next question I have for you. Um, I do want to get to your book that's coming out with the Parliament House, but before that, this is so freaking cool. So you're a TV writer. I and am, yeah. That, okay, so, so the concept of writing a TV comedy about trans life in Vancouver, was this your idea or did, did your co-writer have the, the concept and then you write the content? Like, how did that work? How did you jump into this project? It was a pretty incredible experience and it was actually the first um, TV project that I did and since then I've done other TV and some movie work as well. Um, so for this one I have a very very good well best friend in town now who at the time was an acquaintance and she is trans and wanted to tell this story had this like huge idea she had worked on it as a web series and hadn't gotten off the ground and she decided she needed someone 
with more writing experience to sort of help her get the project off the ground. So we put together what's called a writing room. So we got a whole bunch of people together in a room. Everyone, I think there were two people who were sort of professional writers, which is myself and another woman named Siobhan, and everyone else in the room were amateur writers who had trans experience. And we all got together and sort of talked about their stories and the things they wanted to see that they'd never gotten to see represented on screen. And together we kind of built out the idea of what we wanted the season to look like. And then once we had that concept and those sort of breakdowns, the three writers, so Amy, Siobhan, and myself, took those ideas and formed them into episodes. That's incredible. So when when it comes to, because I, I went onto YouTube, of course, and I watched the trailer, and I was laughing out loud. It's hilarious. If you go to YouTube, type in the Switch, you know, the Switch Vancouver or whatever, and it, it will come up. And I was cracking up. So do you um, have, ex- did you prior to this have experience with comedy writing in particular? Were you writing a lot of the jokes or were you focusing more on like the plotting and the writing itself and letting the people with the trans experience write the jokes? How did that, um, how did you share the burden, so to speak, of the different aspects of writing this? So I didn't have um, any comedy writing experience before this. I did go to school for creative writing. I went to a school here in, in um, Canada called the University of Victoria and another one called the University of Vancouver. And I did study drama writing, and I did a lot of plays and stunt screenplays, but I hadn't done comedy, and it was absolutely terrifying (laughs) to try and be funny on command. (laughs) (laughs) But um, one of the things that you do in a comedy group when you're writing a show is called punching up. So what you do is you kind of, you write the script and you get sort of the bare bones of ideas of what you want some of the jokes to be. And then you get together as a group. So in this case, it was the three writers. And we would read the script out loud and figure out where the moments were that could be funny, where the moments were that weren't. And then you kind of work on it together to punch it up to make it a little bit funnier. So you all work on it together, but you kind of put in the bare bones of where you hope those jokes are going to land. So it sounds like you really had to, this was a lot of like teamwork and group work. I mean, were you guys doing this all on the side and then meanwhile you had day jobs or was, was this your job that you got, uh, you know, commissioned to do this or how did you guys fit this into your schedules to get together and, and write the series? It was a huge challenge. It was completely unpaid at the time. So we were doing what's called on spec writing, okay. where, which I guess is what all novelists do most of the time yeah where you write the book you hope someone's going to pick it up if they pick it up you get paid if they don't pick it up you don't right so mm-hmm. a very similar thing to you know your first and second novel where you're not getting advances yet and you don't have an established relationship you're just kind of writing sticking it on the wall and hoping it sticks so we absolutely had to work around full-time jobs all of us were working we would meet every Saturday for like five hours and then we would meet a couple weekend or weekday nights depending on where we were in the process. And where'd you guys meet at? Um, at the time we didn't have an office yet. Now we've got an office, which is very exciting. Wow. Um, so it was just Amy's house. We had, you know, a bunch of folding chairs pulled up around a big table. That's that is so cool. So this was really like a grassroots movement to write this, and then so, so so yeah. so sort of you know, and and I know you're mainly here to you know talk about your next your next book and everything. So because um, I know I could just go on and on asking because the TV writing thing is just so cool. Like when I when I read that in your bio, I was like, okay, I'm not I'm not even qualified to interview her. <laughs> <laughs> but but so I know a lot of people listening though it's like their dream to see their novel converted into a movie or a TV series. So as somebody who's done this as as the sage wise woman that you are with this experience how would you advise somebody to uh to write a screenplay of their of their concept or their already existing novel? So Fortunately, the reality for most writers is if you have your novel turned into a movie, you won't be allowed to write it. <laughs> you won't be allowed um, to write the movie. Yeah. Okay. You won't be to write the screenplay. So even people like J.K. Rowling didn't get to write screenplays until I don't know if she wrote any of the movies. She was a consultant. Same thing with Fifty Shades of Grey. She was considered a consultant. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, And there was quite a lot of controversy because she got more involved than they thought the author should be on set Mm. in that process. Um, For most people, it's a very different industry. It's a very different style of writing. And some people are fantastic and can do both, and that's wonderful. And for some people, it's just a completely foreign market Mm -hmm. and so they're looking for someone with more screenplay experience to end up writing the adaptation for screenplays i would imagine there are totally different sets of rules than there are in novel writing that the pacing is probably something you have to really pay attention to um scene transitions and things i mean i could never embark upon any kind of screenplay i just don't I'd have to, I feel like I'd have to go read a hundred books and take a college course. And like, it's like a totally different animal to me. Um, it is, it definitely is. I think the hardest uh-huh. thing about screenplays is exposition because you never get to be inside the characters' heads. Uh, so you never get to just tell us how people are feeling or give any history without having to, you know, have people talk about the history. So that I think is the, the biggest challenge for people, especially when they're doing adaptations. Oh, that's a great point because with the visual medium of TV or film, the actors are the ones conveying, you know, we're supposed to be able to look by an expression on their face, how they're feeling, and we can't write that into the, but then we still have to convey it so the actor knows how they're supposed to feel about something. But yeah, I could imagine that that gets really tricky as writers, we get used to the exposition. Yeah. And, And I think that's important for people to know that novel writing and screenplay writing are, are two very different industries and two very different animals, and that even J.K. Rowling herself, the, the goddess, the empress, was not permitted to write her own screenplays of the Harry Potter movie adaptations. She did write the screenplays for the Fantastic Beasts movies, but those were not were not novels prior to, so they were original screenplays by yes. her. And I think that is actually... Um, in my humble opinion, why they suffered story-wise. Because you can tell these were written by a novelist and not a movie writer. And um, there there was way too much backstory and exposition that made for a very lagging film. And so while I think the, those stories would have been fantastic, novelized, um, on the screen, it I mean, for me personally, and for a lot of film critics, didn't seem to work. Um, so... So after your screenwriting um, launch, I'll say, when did, when did the Switch come out? It came out in 2016, I believe. Okay, so, so fairly recently. Um, uh-huh. Although yeah. I, guess, I guess now three years ago, if you can believe it's 2019 already. Oh my god, yeah. <laughs> so, so tell me about In Restless Dreams. You, you originally self-published it. So um, tell me about the writing process, the storyline of that book. What's it about? And um, when you self-published it and your journey thus far with In Restless Dreams. So In Restless Dreams actually has quite an interesting life story. Um, it started, I wrote it when I was just sort of fresh out of school and it was kind of terrible and it sat in a drawer for years as I think many of our projects probably do <laughs> and I pulled it out and rewrote it completely um, so it's a young adult paranormal and it's about a young woman from Nevada who ends up living with her father in New York City for the first time she's 16 years old completely unused to the city has a lot going on in her life and then discovers that she has this ability to influence the world of fairy. So I had this idea of, we have all of these conflicting ideas, these conflicting stories about fairies. And if fairies were real, how could all of these different stories all be real? And I wanted to explore that possibility of what do these magical creatures look like in a sort of real world context? And how could these things exist um, without conflicting with each other. So I came up with this this concept that the fairies are, um, are twisted and changed by humans with extraordinary abilities. So over time, over the centuries, we get all of these very, very different versions of fairies because humans are actually impacting and changing what fairies look like. And how are, how are we impacting and changing what they look like? Through our so beliefs? They, we have these humans called phantasmers, and they literally twist and change the world of fairy by believing in it. So if you look at sort of the 1500s when um, we had a much stronger sort of duality between 
religion and the unknown. We ended up with fairy courts that were um, the seely court and the unseely court. So, you know, evil and chaos versus goodness and order. And earlier than that, before that, we were more connected to um, seasonal changes. It was about, you know, agriculture and about Mm -hmm. um, farming. So we had um, courts that were connected to the seasons. So we had the winter court and the summer court. Gotcha. So you had it sitting in a drawer and what made you decide to pull it out and type it up or or dust it off on your hard drive and self-publish it? So there was a a newish company and unfortunately I can't remember the name of them because they they crashed and burned, Um, but they were trying this, this thing where they would get people to submit their novels online and you would try and get sort of votes on your novel and the ones that got the most votes they accept that would get a publishing contract so kind of like kindle scout if yeah, anybody exactly. remembers that yeah so the challenge with all of these contests is that once you've put your novel up on the internet for free you've kind of ruined it for a lot of traditional publishers a lot of people yes. won't look at anything that's been up on the internet yes um, so they can be unfortunately a little bit predatory for newer authors who are trying to get their work up and are kind of you know really desperate and excited for that opportunity which mm-hmm. as we all know is very difficult to get that first opportunity mm-hmm. um so i thought about it and i said well i've been curious about self-publishing for a while it seemed like a big step and i've been kind of afraid to take it so if I put this novel into this contest and it fails, I can still self-publish it and it'll let me kind of try that out. So I decided to go for it. So I put the novel into the contest and it epically failed. <laughs> um, social media marketing is not my skill set. So, and I think the company unfortunately doesn't exist anymore either. Um, so I put it up, it didn't work, I took it down and then I thought, okay, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to try out this, this crazy, wacky world of self-publishing. And what year would that have been? That would have been, I think the contest was in 2015, and I self-published the novel in 2016. Okay, so did you just do, did you upload it to KDP, or did you go through like a self-publishing service, like Ex Libris or something, or how did you? Uh, no, I uploaded it directly to KDP, and then I also did the Amazon direct print so you could get physical copies as well. Gotcha, okay. And then, and then did you, so you just kind of hinted that the social media market, you know, marketing wasn't your forte. So did you get much of a launch on that at all? Did you pull in some some buys or some reviews or just just kind of family and friends? How did that go for you? Yeah, it was a it was a great learning experience. It was really, really interesting. Um, I probably emailed like 100 different bloggers to ask for coverage. I got one. Yep, that's how it goes, folks. <laughs> New authors, <laughs> listen up. This is what it's like. <laughs> yeah. So that was um, that was pretty much it. I was relying on the kind of the, the blog launch. Um, and then, of course, you know, getting family and friends to put reviews up on Goodreads and Amazon. I did end up with reviews from people I'd never heard of, so they must have been hearing about me from somewhere, but I'm not sure what worked and what didn't. Uh-huh. Um, I wasn't... Um, good at tracking, you know, tracking conversions and doing the sort of SEO and the marketing side of things in terms of, you know, tracking UTMs and trying to figure out where people were coming from and what was working and what wasn't working. It's, there's a lot of, of really interesting challenges to self-publishing that people don't think about. You know, you say, I'm a wonderful writer and I have a really strong book and that should be enough. And unfortunately it's not. That's incredibly correct. And I'll tell you, even with, I have a, I have a nano degree. It's like a certificate in digital marketing and social media marketing. And it's, even with that, it is still, um, what's the word there, there, <laughs> it's a moving target. So I mean, you can even learn all of this stuff. And then tomorrow Amazon will change their algorithm. So there really is no, um, there's there's no cut and dry formula for how to do this, folks, and it really is throwing wet noodles at the wall and seeing which ones stick. Um, 
you know, unless unless you're Bella Forrest, who I ha- I believe is a corporation, by the way, which because ha- nobody ain't nobody written a seventy book series in five years. I'm sorry, of like every book is like four hundred pages. There, that is not humanly possible. She is a corporation. I'm gonna find out who she is. I'm gonna find out who they are, <laughs> and they have cracked the code. But un- until uh, until then, um, <laughs> so so you had it sitting on KDP. You got some reviews you got you got some exposure on it so um so at what point did Ren say you know what I want this to be I want to have a makeover for this and and uh put this submit this to a publishing company um at what point were you dissatisfied with where it was and wanted to publish I'm sorry wanted to submit to the parliament house and how did you even find the parliament house press so I think after about six or seven months, the sales had kind of dropped and it was clear that it wasn't going to go anywhere else unless I could figure out something else to do with it. So I was thinking about a lot of different strategies in terms of what I could do. One of the great things about books is that it doesn't necessarily have to be in that moment of launch, right? So if you mm-hmm. have a book that's been struggling, it's not too late to try and find a way to revitalize sales and kind of keep getting it out there. But I was also um, working on other projects. I write pretty um, (laughs) nonstop, so I have, I think, four manuscripts that are just kind of sitting in my back pocket looking for a home, so I'm always on the lookout um, for, you know, publishers and agents and people that I'm interested in working for, uh, with, pardon me, so at the time, I think I was pretty actively trying to push a different novel, and I subscribed to an incredible service if you're an aspiring author. It's called Authors Published Magazine. It's free. It's a newsletter. It goes out, I think, once a week, and it just has lists of people who are currently publishing. So it has lists of agents. It has lists of publishers. It has um, paid writing opportunities that come up once in a while. Authors Published Magazine. It's fantastic. It's how I found Omnific and how I found, I think, how I found Parliament House as well. That is a great resource. I'm writing that down as we speak, and I'll probably be adding that I have um, on ckbrook.com slash, I think it's resources dash four dash writers. Um, Or you just go to ckbrook.com and go to the tab that says resources for writers. I have all kinds of stuff like that on there, and I'm going to be adding Authors Published Magazine to that. So thank you for that. So, So you believe you found the Parliament House through this resource. This was like a like a daily newsletter that you got emailed to you? Yes, exactly. Okay. And I, that, I think that's where I saw them, but I had, I had also started seeing them just sort of around on Instagram, on Facebook. I just adored their aesthetic. It's absolutely beautiful. I don't know if um, everyone is familiar with them, but they publish pretty much exclusively paranormal stuff and they have this very witchy vibe and they're just doing a phenomenal phenomenal social media game um so i was really really interested in working with them i just loved loved love what they were what they were doing and i so i checked out their submissions page and i saw that they were open to republishing um self-published work and it hadn't occurred to me that there are people out there who who do that who are willing to do that you sort of hear you know, big success stories where someone self-publishes and it gets a lot of traction and some huge publisher picks them up. And I think, you know, for a lot of um, smaller indie people, that's kind of still the dream. Yeah. Um, But it hadn't occurred to me that smaller publishers would be uh, uh, open to this as well. And In Restless Dreams seemed like a great fit because it had gotten great reviews from people I didn't know as well as people I did know, which is always a big, you know, exciting moment for a smaller author, I think. It is. <laughs> so, and I, you know, the big failure had been in the in the marketing and publicity department, which I'm just, you know, is not my forte. And that's, of course, what a publisher brings to the table is that experience that authors just don't have. So if it's something that, you know, you're not as good at and you need help with, that's where the publisher really comes in and kind of saves you. So... I sent it in and crossed my fingers and hoped for the best, and here we are. So that's fantastic. How long, and congratulations, by the way. And when was this that they accepted your manuscript? It was this summer. Okay, so summer 2018, so fairly recently. And um, so, so for some people who may not be... Um, 
terribly familiar with the process. Um, you get signed by an indie press um, because the Parliament House, you know, uh, they're they're not Harper Collins, they're not Simon and Schuster, they're not Random House, they're they're not one of the what we call in the industry the Big Five. They are an independent press, um, which is awesome because we are undercutting the Big Five. Because why should they have a monopoly? Oh. And. <laughs> and um, and when you get signed by a smaller press, one of the advantages is that they work a bit faster than the big five. The big five, it could be at least two years, even up to five years between getting signed with them and actually having your book hit shelves. Um, so what process are you in right now with the manuscript and what has been the process up till now? So the first thing obviously is getting your your contracts and getting all of the sort of paperwork signed out of the way and then the team at parliament house connects you with your editor so there will be two editors over the course of the process one helps you work on story and then one just does copy editing looking for you know errors in in the sort of textual stuff so the first editing process is the more exciting one so that's the one where you kind of dive into what's working and what's not working, are there things that need adjusting, are there things you need to rewrite. Um, for me, especially because this has been self-published, I've had, you know, friends do better beta reading for me and stuff, but it hadn't had a professional eye. So it was really exciting to have someone come in and be able to talk that over with them. So I got a series of sort of in-depth notes, and then I also got the manuscript back with a bunch of notes on that. And I had, I think it was a month and a half sort of dive in and and do all of those big rewrites and that's what I just finished doing uh, last week it was very exciting oh very then, very time consuming too <laughs> yeah, very, yeah and that was an interesting challenge because I was working on a huge screen play project and I was working at my full-time job and I was doing some <laughs> teaching on the side and it was the holidays of course <laughs> So balancing is an, always a challenge, I think, for for writers because, again, we're working on spec. These things aren't, you know, we're not getting paid until the book comes out. Mm -hmm. So you do have to sort of hunt for time in your schedule and pull those moments out to really be able to dive in and get the work done. Yes, you do. You can't just work when you feel like you're, you know, the creativity is flowing. You have to make the creativity flow on command <laughs> most of the yes, time exactly. for most of us. Um, so, so you finished the, uh, was it the primary editing stage, the content editing? Yeah, so I've done my, my first draft of the content editing. That will go back to the content editor for one more look, and I'll have one more go over it for just minor little tweaks and notes and stuff. And then it will head on to copy editing. Wow. Okay. So you've got that ahead of you. And then I assume, are you guys working on cover design uh, yet? Not yet. Okay. It's not coming out until spring 2020, just because okay. of their schedule and how many other wonderful books are coming out between now and then. So I think that will probably not be until the summer. Gotcha. Okay. So you do have that to look forward to. Cover reveals yes. are always an exciting thing. So <laughs> so if you can believe it, Ren, we have been recording for over 30 minutes. Oh my gosh. I know, it flies because it's, <laughs> it it's always so much fun and so interesting to hear another fellow author's journey, the differences, the similarities. Um, I want to point out to anybody listening that if you have a paranormal or... Um, horror, fantasy, gothic, can be young adult, uh, new adult, adult manuscript that is looking for a home, parliamenthousepress.com is Ren's uh, third publisher, and they have an amazing lineup of um, books that have recently come out, books that are about to come out. I um, I have edited a few of their manuscripts. They are breathtaking. Um, I edit. I'm the official resident blurb girl. Full disclosure <laughs> for them. Um, I I it's a labor of love. I'm not. Uh, financially affiliated. <laughs> I'm not I'm not getting paid to say that or to promote them or anything. Um I just voluntarily offer my time to edit their blurbs because um I just think that it's such a cool company and a cool project. Um and I just wanted to offer my support in whatever way I could with the limited time that I have. So um I that is how I came across Ren was I'm in the 
uh, kind of the official author Facebook group for being uh, having edited some of their books and for being the blurb girl. And so I put out a call to their authors, and that's how Ren and I discovered each other. Uh, but yes, if you have a uh, especially paranormal, but anything that falls into the realm of fantasy and uh, kingdom fantasy, especially dark fantasy um, stuff like that, they are are all into that. And I think they're acquiring titles for 2020 at the moment. Um, so um, perhaps maybe by now, since it's 2019, it may be 2021, uh, but they are open to submissions. Ren, if people want to learn more about you and your books, where can they find you? I'm very active on Facebook. You can find me at Ren Hanman Writer on Facebook, and I occasionally tweet if I'm at Ren Hanman. I'm lucky to be the only Ren Hanman in the world, so I'm very easily searchable. <laughs> and that's Ren with a W. It's W-R-E-N. Go ahead. Is there, do you have a website, um, Amazon handle? Sorry, I'm about to cough. Oh, you're go for it. <laughs> <laughs> go for it. Get the cough out. Sorry. Uh, yes, I have a website. It's just uh, redhandman.com. Awesome. So redhandman.com. And do you have um, blog, newsletter, anything that they can follow for updates to know, like when your cover is revealed or when your next book is out? I'm not doing anything actively right now, but you can definitely find all that. Gotcha. On social media, fantastic. And as always, folks, I'm at ckbrook.com, youtube.com slash ckbrook. That's Brook with an E. Definitely be sure to subscribe to my newsletter at ckbrook.com slash subscribe to be notified of all the exciting news and announcements, um, including I'm sure I'll be sending out some features on this awesome interview series with these amazing fellow indie authors. Ren, thank you so very much for your time this morning. I know it's, is it 9 a.m. there where you are, 940 at this point where yeah, you are? I, think it's about 9 <laughs> I, I apologize for keeping you up or for waking you up early. <laughs> in uh, Over in Eastern time, it's 1240. And when we were scheduling, uh, Ren had thought that we were uh, scheduling this in Pacific time. So she was in for a rude awakening yesterday when I <laughs> informed her it was Eastern time. So I really appreciate you. Um, speaking to me at the early hour and I hope it stops raining there long enough for you to get a little bit of sunshine or something. <laughs> that would be nice. Probably not till March. <laughs> <laughs> it was fantastic speaking with you and <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for joining us.